I'd like to uh, uh, invite Bernie Hertel up here from Emerald Therapeutics. Bernie. Where's the um, And the I got you the clicker right here. <clears throat> Great. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your, your time and your interest. My name is Bernie Hertel. Uh, with Emerald Health Therapeutics, which is based in Vancouver. We're going to be talking about a few, uh, few forward-looking statements. Uh, you know all about looking at uh, filings and so on for risk factors. So um, just a, a quick background. I'm sure most of you probably have a, a good sense of uh, uh, what cannabis is about and so on. But we, we start out talking very briefly about uh, the idea of the endocannabinoid system for a couple of reasons and that's because uh, I say that we, we look at this magical plant through a life sciences lens by virtue of a lot of the people involved with our company. What is the endocannabinoid system? It's a system in the body that is involved in regulating hunger, pain, anxiety, sleep and so on and there's a reason that the, the plant uh, has uh, an impact in the body. It's because there are receptors uh, that are part of the endocannabinoid system. The body actually makes cannabinoids uh, as you can see um, on this top of the slide uh, cannabinoids come from the cannabis plant you can make cannabinoids synthetically and a point that's relevant to something I'm going to show you later is that there are also plants and plant ingredients that interact with the endocannabinoid system and can affect it that uh, are not from cannabis and hemp and of course uh, there are many different cannabinoids uh, only one of them is actually psychoactive so contrary to you know, the idea that cannabis itself broadly is just this uh, one thing that is, uh, makes people high and should be considered to be equivalent to heroin, uh, at least that's what we all grew up thinking, right, or being told. Uh, the reality is that none of the other cannabinoids are psychoactive and there are a lot of potential medicinal and, and wellness benefits. So we do look particularly at that aspect of the business in terms of the medicinal and wellness benefits, but uh, Canada being the, the first major country to legalize recreationally there's obviously a business opportunity and we are very focused on the recreational opportunity. But that being said, still, uh, you know, apart from just consuming dried flour and smoking it, there is an opportunity to create products that also, uh, we say, could increase the, enhance the ability of consumers to consume with confidence. Uh, you know, if you have a beer at the end of the day today, you, you know, or a glass of wine, you know that every time you have it, you're going to have a particular experience with it that's unique to you, but is pretty consistent. You don't necessarily have that with dried flour in terms of the, the mix of the cannabinoids and, and the, the dose, so to speak, and so on. So there's tremendous opportunities there to create products that uh, are more consistent in that manner. So Emerald is a company that does, in fact, have a, a substantial production footprint. Uh, has one of the single largest growing facilities uh, through a joint venture that we have. Uh, we were a pioneer in sourcing hemp in Canada last year. We have access to one of the single largest extraction facilities in Canada. And obviously, if you're creating value-added products, extraction is the next key step that you have to, to go through after, after basically securing and drying and, and having the dried the flour available. We are very focused on uh, developing differentiated value-added products. And uh, ultimately, we have some, a product line that we're uh, also marketing that is uh, a product line that does interact with the endocannabinoid system, but is not based on cannabis and hemp. Key individual involved uh, that's been a driver behind our company is uh, Dr. Aftar Dillon, who's the executive chairman and president. Uh, he was a practicing family physician for over a dozen years. Uh, worked in venture, life sciences venture capital for a few years and uh, was the president and then later the, the chairman of a biotechnology company in the U.S. And he just stepped down from that company after about 18 years. So a lot of conviction and, and commitment to the projects that he, that he steps into. I'm not going to go through all the different individuals, but you know, we have all the key people in place as far as growing expertise, uh, decades of that. Uh, you know, another person from the life sciences world, our, our QA person, worked with uh, a key biotech company in Vancouver for quite a number of years. Uh, on our scientific advisory board, you've got people from, you've got medical uh, specialists. Uh, we've got a couple of individuals who have been doing cannabinoid research for over a dozen years out of uh, Spain and Italy, and there's not a lot of people in the world that can make that particular claim. 
So a lot of great people guiding, uh, guiding our efforts. So to be in the business, flipping from illegal to legal, uh, you can't just go, you might be focused on value added products, that's fine, but you can't just go out and buy cannabis in the open market. That doesn't really exist yet in a, in a really broad sense. I mean, it does exist. You can buy uh, product, can buy dried flour on a bulk basis. But we set out uh, a couple of years ago to, to make an impact in the way we were going to do this, and we established a joint venture with one of the largest greenhouse growers of vegetables in North America, a company called Village Farms. This greenhouse that you see is in the Vancouver area. It's 1.1 million square feet. Uh, it still had tomatoes in it up until November of 2017. Today, it's uh, fully converted, fully licensed for cultivation, fully planted. It's, it's in full production. And full production translates to conservative, conservatively uh, about 75,000 kilograms of production a year. Those numbers are, in fact, probably a bit conservative compared to what other licensed producers are suggesting their effective yield would be for this type of facility. And we do that because we still want to get through a few more growing cycles and, and some more seasons. Um, but the reality is that this facility was designed, it was completely stripped out, it was designed to be very optimal for growing this particular plant in this type of facility. And the quality that's coming up and the yield is uh, something that we're pretty excited about, pretty pleased with at this juncture. These are a few pictures from inside. Uh, you know, some of the, the into there's 16 growing rooms, and, and the rooms are you know 60,000 square feet each. So it provides the economies of scale while providing the segregation of uh, you know dealing with the different types of uh, variables that you deal with in this type of growing environment. Um, but uh, you know, sophisticated in terms of the systems that are in there for managing the the microclimate and and the handling systems and so on. Now this, in this complex, there's actually a second greenhouse of 1.1 million square feet and a third one of 2.6 million square feet. So we have the first one in this joint venture, which is wholly owned by the joint venture called Pure Sun Farms. And just recently, uh, the joint venture actually exercised this option on a second greenhouse of an additional 1.1 million square feet. So this facility ultimately is going to have 2.2 million square feet uh, by the end of next year, we'll be uh, fully operational in the second facility as well. And we're looking at, uh, cons again, conservatively, 150,000 kilograms of production. Uh, in the first greenhouse, we're already down to just above a dollar a gram Canadian in cultivation cost. And uh, that facility in the first quarter had a, a gross margin, had gross profit uh, percentage of, of about 65%. So uh, this is already performing very well, and, and the expectation and the aspiration is to be certainly among the very low-cost growers, if not the lowest-cost grower. The third greenhouse, not yet exercised, think about that as optionality, in the sense that if uh, there was a particular player uh, that wanted to have access to one cohesive complex in one spot, this would be the single largest facility or complex in Canada that's operating at this point in time. Uh, and has that, that uh, opportunity to, to expand. Now, Emerald itself, we have the 50% economic or financial interest in this asset, uh, which is tremendously valuable at this point, but we're taking 40% of the production, which we pay for, obviously, uh, from this facility, and then starting next year with the expanded facility, we'll be dropping that to 25%, but it'll be a lo larger amount overall of production. So just to put this in perspective, there's been some analysts that have put uh, evaluation on this facility in the 1.2, 1.3 million range, sorry, billion range, just this one, just the one greenhouse. And if you translate that through uh, in terms of uh, 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 about a four, four to five times um, uh, price to, um, to uh, production or revenue uh, uh, metric, uh, and look at our, our share structure and so on, that in itself is probably about a $5 uh, per share price right now for our company, and we're trading below that price right now, and that's just for the one greenhouse. So this is a significant value uh, in terms of the asset base that we have. Uh, we also just announced yesterday that we have received our cultivation license for another facility, a wholly owned facility, uh, also in the Vancouver area, which is going to be focus, focused on organic growing. This is two greenhouses of 75,000 square feet, plus 12 acres of outdoor grow, and uh, the potential for another 12 acres. 
Uh, you can see on the left picture there, you see the complex in the bottom, and then you see some dirt a little bit further beyond that. That's the growing area. So um, uh, this is another, we've got, uh, we've had a pretty broad set of genetics in our portfolio, and we've been looking at what we think are the most ideal uh, genetics for uh, organic and for outdoor growing. And uh, we still have some uh, municipal permitting to go through, but this facility we expect to see coming up uh, in the fairly near future. We have an indoor facility in Quebec, uh, which we uh, embraced and, and which we acquired with the idea that it would give us an easier entree into the Quebec marketplace, which is the second largest population uh, from a provincial perspective in Canada. So this is 88,000 square feet. Uh, we expect to grow uh, plus or minus 8,000 kilograms in this particular facility. By the way, in the, uh, in the organic facility, between the, the greenhouse itself plus the outdoor, we're looking at prospectively about 30,000 kilograms of production. Uh, in this facility, apart from the growing itself, uh, we have a larger packaging and processing area and capability in that uh, facility uh, such that we can potentially process about 50,000 kilograms. So with an indoor facility, as you may be aware, you're ultimately looking at potentially being able to grow the higher, highest quality of, of dried flour. And, and so while we're not exclusively focused on the recreational marketplace and dried flour as a product, uh, there's still much tremendous benefit in being able to produce very high quality product that's premium priced and, and can garner you some, some distinction in the marketplace. So we're set up to have different types of products uh, with different types of, of pricing and margin across the board, uh, including the lowest cost, which would be outdoor grow in order to serve our goals. And, and part of that also then relates to, to this outdoor grow, which is, uh, which is hemp. And uh, we were uh, early in securing uh, contracts for flower and leaf from hemp in Canada. The Canadian government only legalized extraction of CBD from hemp in August. Um, we had secured this beforehand, uh, anticipating that. And then, uh, but because of the timing, we were a little bit late in the season as far as harvesting. So the CBD level in this wasn't particularly high, but it is economic and we went through a great learning curve because there's been no experience around really as far as harvesting hemp in, in large scale for, the, for the, the leaf and for the flower. It's being used for industrial purposes. It was more the stem that was being used. So uh, we have a tremendous experience with that already. This year we've contracted for 1,200 acres, looking at over 270,000 kilograms. In Canada, the typical content of, of CBD is in the 3 to 4% range. We're just saying conservatively about 2%. Bottom line is we expect to uh, derive a, a notable amount of uh, CBD extract out of this um, plant material uh, that has the prospect of being worth many tens of millions of dollars uh, at a wholesale level for emerald. So again, another key asset uh, that is not really ref reflected with our, our, current, um, our current valuation. How are we going to uh, process, sorry, process, I'm Canadian. Uh, how are we gonna process this hemp? We did another very strategic deal with the largest natural health products company in Canada called the Factors Group. They're the largest by virtue of their own brand, which is, the which is called Natural Factors, but in particular because they're the largest private labeler of natural health supplements and those types of products in Canada. And in fact, they have a footprint in over 50 countries in the world, including the US. They have a facility in British Columbia that can process a million kilograms of plant material through extraction. That's a huge amount of capacity. That is the single largest, would be the single largest facility in Canada uh, doing anything related to cannabis or hemp. So, uh, and they can actually encapsulate 600 million soft gels. So that first harvest of hemp was frozen. We're waiting for the factors group to get their license on this facility, uh, which you know, we expect to be around the corner. And um, to then be able to take that frozen hemp as well as the hemp that we'll harvest year, this year and put that, run that through this facility, convert it into either just oil or into, into soft gels and uh, get that into the marketplace, which is uh, very limited as far as CBD oils uh, at this point in time. Now, we have actually uh, manufactured for some CBD oil for the recreational marketplace, and we actually ran that through one of the independent um, 
uh, other independent uh, uh, extraction companies, a company called Metafarm, and we made a first shipment to British Columbia. So we have our fingers in, in different facets of this to be, uh, make sure we're in the game and moving forward and taking advantage of these opportunities. In terms of supply agreements and distribution, we are virtually across the whole country. We um, are only missing Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as far as the provinces. And then um, uh, we're missing a couple of territories and no disrespect to uh, in, in the indigenous people in our country, but for the most part, those territories are primarily moose and caribou. So we're not missing much by not having those yet at this point. So we've got the country covered as far as distribution. You may be well aware that in Canada, despite being forward thinking as far as legalizing cannabis, uh, the Canadian government embarked with a very restrictive marketing and branding uh, guide, set of guidelines to start with. And so cannabis is being, uh, brand, uh, the branding that's allowed around cannabis is more like tobacco than alcohol. So we have an initiative that is absolutely unique in terms of, what, in terms of the Canadian marketplace. Uh, this particular product line, it's called the Endo line, was created by a sister company. There's actually a portfolio of companies, all have the name Emerald, that are all involved in cannabis and cannabinoids. Some of them are more biotech oriented, looking more at uh, you know, the overall clinical opportunities and going through that clinical process. But one of them is a, more of a natural health products company and created this product line, which is based on those plant ingredients I referred to earlier that are not cannabis or hemp but do interact with the endocannabinoid system. So these products are called Calm, Bliss, Sleep, Inflame, and Brain. And because they, are, they do not contravene federal law in either country, uh, and it wouldn't anyways in Canada because it's legal, but uh, in the US, uh, this product line has actually been vetted and gone through an extensive due diligence process and being listed by Whole Foods, which is being a little bit more conservative and not embracing CBD yet, because it has CBD-like characteristics. In Canada, what we can do with this, we can go into channels that you cannot go into with cannabis or hemp. We can go into natural health product stores, grocery stores, and pharmacies. About 60% of cannabis users, based on research we've done, uh, are also users, users of natural health products. So what we're aiming for here is the cross-marketing, cross-branding benefit of having the Emerald name in those channels. This product line will serve as its own profit center and uh, you know, has significant potential. This product line is already being, has already been, uh, is already being listed in various natural health product stores in Canada, and there's going to be some bigger steps uh, ahead of us as far as more of a, a corporate launch of this particular brand. Ultimately, if we see the type of segregation that we're starting to see in these states with the US Farm Bill and the different treatment of hemp, you know, logically, if you think about it, uh, why should cannabis just be cannabis? Why, you know, not everybody, nobody's really thinking about, nobody normal is thinking about cannabis being equivalent to heroin, but that's still the way the laws look when it comes down to it. Um, but logically, you can see the separation of a psychoactive cannabinoid called THC from all the other cannabinoids that are not psychoactive, like CBD. And that's where things are, are appearing to be going, although it's got lots of challenges and, and there's a road ahead in the US. But if we see that in Canada, Ultimately, we could take CBD or other non-psychoactive cannabinoids and potentially drop that into this product line. We'd already have the marketing and shelf presence. So there's a lot of potential in terms of the strategic role this product line can play. So ultimately, we are very focused on, on product development, on innovation. Uh, we talk a lot about giving consumers the ability to consume with confidence. So when I talked earlier about that example of, of uh, you know, consuming a drink and knowing what's in it, uh, you know, same thing with cannabis, even on the recreational side. You know, can you have uh, product formats that are better able to provide consistency in terms of the ratio of the cannabinoids, the dose, and so on, so that people can have a common kind of experience. And we've actually trademarked the words um, take control and uh, define dose uh, as an example of, of where we're thinking about, you know, where we're heading in the recreational side of things as well as on the, on the medicinal side. Uh, we are working behind the scenes with different initiatives. We have filed for certain patents trade secrets and so on we have in place. But we've also been looking outside and as an example of an yet another agreement that we've established, uh, we have a partnership with the largest extraction company in the world called Indina out of Italy. And they have proprietary extraction technology which we're going to employ with uh, an expanded uh, extraction facility that we're going to be constructing in Canada. They also have technology relating to formulation, the different forms of, of how you can take an active ingredient and make that available to a consumer, whether it's an oil or you smoke it or it's a pill, et cetera. 
uh, and they have technology relating to enhancing, for example, bioavailability. So the, the length of time and the way in which you can have an active ingredient absorbed in the body. Uh, Indina actually serves the, the pharmaceutical industry. They have even serve, uh, you know, particular entities in the, in the cannabis world. So uh, an excellent partner for us to be working with. We also have some other people within our broad circle of people from our broad group that are, are providing guidance to the company along in terms of product development and so on. So those, um, the individuals I mentioned that have been doing cannabinoid research for over a dozen years who are out of Italy and Spain, uh, you know, for example, this is an example of the type of work that they've done. They've been published in the British Journal of Pharmacology. They were looking at the psycho, um, sorry, the neuroprotective capabilities of THCA, which is the precursor to THC. And this isn't necessarily work that we're working with directly in, in Emerald Health Therapeutics, but this is an example of the type of, the caliber of these people, the type of work that they're doing, and uh, their potential to help guide our, our product development efforts. We also have a dealer license, which allows you to provide, you know, undertake certain analytical testing services and uh, different types of uh, activities as far as importing and exporting. Uh, won't dwell on that. The, the bottom line is that we have a, a, a company here, vertically integrated, that has all the key pieces in place um, in terms of production, uh, large-scale production, uh, efficient production, uh, very large-scale extraction. We're focused on product development, unique intellectual property. I, we don't have a slide on it, but we are going, intending to run human studies. Not necessarily going through that whole path that a biotech company would go through in terms of the full clinical and regulatory process, but in the natural health products world, for example, uh, you can run uh, single arm studies, observational studies uh, in humans with a particular product, have certain observations, you can publish that and you can establish, to have, establish certain credibility, certain useful knowledge and have that as a, as a useful marketing tool. So we're going to be, we're actually planning right now certain studies that will uh, leverage and, and use certain products that we have for particular conditions. Um, you can see we've got some unique approaches to branding and we're well set up with distribution and sales. So right now we're sitting with 144 million shares, outstanding. Our valuation has been in the, uh, the 400 million Canadian range the, the last bit, we've come down a little bit more recently, uh, have about 16 million in cash. Um, we're burning about uh, 2.5 uh, uh, a month, but uh, we are right around the corner. Uh, we're right in our inflection point as far as our revenue starting to ramp up. So the green bars you see here are emerald, and you can see that through most of the quarters of last year, uh, we were, had about 300,000 in top line. But in the fourth quarter, we hit 1.1 million. In the first quarter, we hit 2.6. And the orange bars represent our joint venture. So we don't, as a 50-50 joint venture, we don't consolidate their financials into ours. So from zero in the second quarter, uh, you can see that the revenue of the joint venture was up to 14.4 million in the first quarter. And this is being nowhere close to full production, not anywhere close to full production. So we're hitting the inflection point and you're going to see revenues going up quarter over quarter. Uh, you know, we're on a track to see uh, nine-digit levels of revenue. We haven't put out guidance on explicitly what that number would look like or the exact timing, but you can see that we've got the facilities that can generate uh, a lot of production, a lot of sales uh, with good margin. Oh, and um, make it a little bit more intimate here. Um, so uh, we're very excited about uh, you know, the quality that's coming out, the yield that's coming out of our, our, the, the particular facility, the joint venture. Uh, we're excited about ramping up our particular facilities. We're still waiting for a couple of additional licenses to keep that moving along, but we're right there. And uh, you know, very excited about our prospects for, for notable growth and to create a, our own unique positioning in the, in the marketplace. And the bottom line is uh, you know, this particular company and the assets we have are being valued a, a lot less on a comparative basis compared to you know, the top tier of licensed producers in Canada, and we believe represent uh, a very intriguing uh, opportunity at this point, uh, a, a compelling value proposition from an investment point of view with, uh, with significant upside. Appreciate your time and your interest. I think there's a, maybe a little time for some questions. Substances that, that are not cannabinoids that, that interact with the other cannabinoids? 
So uh, the question was, what are the substances that <clears throat> interact with the endocannabinoid system that are not cannabis and hemp? Uh, that's a trade secret in terms of what our, um, what's in our product line. Uh, there are papers that have been published on different ingredients, and we canvassed that and uh, went through that, and we've employed that, but we haven't, we're not saying staining state. Say if it's chocolate or something no. else? No. Okay. That's the beauty of trade secrets and the necessity of trade secrets. Got it. Other questions? Yes, sir. As a consumer, how do we know it's effective? And you know, especially when you're doing the testing. So the question was, uh, as a consumer, how do we know it's effective, uh, especially when we are, our company, for example, is doing the testing. So I just want to clarify, when you say, how do we know it's effective, what is the precision, what's the precise thing you're looking for with the question? What, what, when you say, what, what is effective? Right. So how do we know it's effective? Well, that's something that uh, ultimately has variables to it, for sure, uh, which is a you know, common kind of practice or a scenario with, with natural health products. You tap, typically have some studies and, and some experience with ingredients. You know, these particular um, uh, plants uh, and so on have been studied in, with, different, um, with, different, uh, in, in different, with different activities and have been published. Um, but again, from a competitive point of view, we want to keep that secret. Um, so it would be an experience, it would be anecdotal over time. There, we've also, with these particular products, there are also what we call hero ingredients, which are, we've put in because they're ingredients that are common, more commonly understood and recognized by consumers, such as, you know, for example, echinacea, which have more understood types of capabilities. So we've, from a marketing point of view, we've employed that as well. Yes? So the question was, uh, you know, are we looking at uh, creating products that could be used by other, by other consumer used by other consumer product companies, consumer products? Yes. So we are, um, you know, absolutely looking at and interested. We're open to uh, relationships, as we've already, you know, we've employed relationships to build out our infrastructure, and we're certainly interested in relationships from an overall marketing uh, perspective. And yeah, we're aiming to create products that will ultimately stand more alone in terms of their capabilities. Uh, that's still coming. It's not particularly granular and visible right now, but ultimately, yes, we'd like to leverage relationships in that context as well. Yes? I saw your Yeah, I remember you. Hi, how are you doing? Can you come up and say that into the mic, please? <laughs> Sure. So just to repeat the first comment, um, <laughs> sorry, I don't remember your name, but, but she used the word spectacular in the context of having been in our one facility and seen it. Um, the question was uh, related to microtoxins and uh, what are the standards and how does healthcare, Health Canada apply that. I can't give you an explicit as far as, you know, all, whether they've covered all the microtoxins. I know that that's probably still a moving target and an evolving process. Certainly it's something they take very seriously. So I'd imagine that ultimately they're going to cover off whatever the key toxins are that need to be covered. Um, and the testing is, is rigorous and the testing is absolutely required and necessary. So uh, I can't give more granularity on that, but I would believe that there's a level, there's standards there that are far beyond, certainly far beyond whatever exists in the illegal world. So it, you know, it's going to evolve and, and land where it needs to land, I would think. Am I done? Yep. Uh, thank, Bernie, thank, thank you very you so much. much. Bernie, thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have a question for Bernie of when they're going to start developing some CBD products for moose, uh, <laughs> but that'll be in the near future, right? Uh, maybe not moose, but we are working on initiatives in the United States. I should mention that All right, as well. All right, good. Thank you.